Hello, I'm Stuart Brand uh, from the Long Now Foundation and sort of at the Long Now Foundation in the interval, our bar in San Francisco. Pretty quiet right now because of the pandemic. Uh, we're shooting in a very socially, distancely responsible way. So while the speaker tonight and I are both in the bar, we're at some distance, we'll just come together on the screen. Um, the talk has been uh, recorded and edited to about a little over half an hour. Uh, and so it is a very refined presentation in that respect. And then it goes improvisational after the talk when uh, the speaker and I uh, go live with you. And if you have questions during it, uh, depending on what medium you're coming in, put your questions there and I'll try to uh, add them to the discussion. Cities is the subject tonight. And uh, historians say that cities is where civilization happens. Uh, since civilization is sort of the customer for the Long Now Foundation, we're always interested in uh, how to think about cities, how to improve cities, and uh, how the history of cities plays out. The speaker tonight, in my view, is a longtime friend, longtime colleague. Uh, I knew him uh, before he was even the state architect uh, with Sam Vanderein and here in California. Uh, he has been one of the major designers of cities, uh, not only with various ideas which spread everywhere like new urbanism and walkability, but also in terms of actually designing real cities, in some cases new cities in China, redesigning uh, cities everywhere. Uh, he's got some ideas we'll hear about currently of how to make uh, things work better in California. And uh, please welcome a guy who really shapes cities, which shapes civilization, Peter Calthorpe. Well, thank you, Stuart. Uh, cities, over the long run, climate change is gonna hurt millions, if not billions, if we cannot cope with it in a serious way. It's an existential threat. And the way we live is at the essence of how we deal with that issue. And the way we live is the product of the environment we build. When we build a city, we build a set of behaviors. We build our own lifestyle, our relationships to nature, our relationships to each other, our relationships to money. You know, they're all prescribed in ways that we even stop seeing. We just take for granted that this is the normal way of being. And so much is predetermined by the way we shape our cities that I think it's the most potent tool we have to confront a lot of our long challenges, not our short challenges. Now, a lot of projections show that we're going to get to 70% of the global population in cities. Cities are where 80% of the economic activity is. It's where 70% of the energy gets used. We're going to add another 3 billion people to cities, largely in the emerging economies in the global south, but we're also going to remake our cities as well in the next 30, 40 years. And we've got to get it right. But this is what cities do. It's where innovation happens. It's where people go for economic opportunity. It's where women get a chance to have standing in their society. It's where education and literacy takes off. It's where economic ha growth happens for developing uh, societies. And it is proven many times over that it's the low carbon way to live and it's the lightest footprint on the earth. Meanwhile, we look at what's around us and it's becoming more and more painful. Homelessness, racism, the early impacts of climate change, whether it's fire or flooding. These are things that are upon us now. We have to think systemically about them. Cities are our biggest opportunity to stop being wasteful of land, of energy, of materials, of human potential. And so these are the big challenges we have, but I, I think in shaping the city, we can solve them all in some kind of comprehensive way. I think one of the reasons we're least capable of getting at our deepest problems is what we live in stovepipes, specialists dealing with specialized issues. So affordable housing becomes a stovepipe that doesn't really recognize that for example, where a house is, is just as important as how expensive a house is. Because the farther you travel, the more it burdens your household economy. But it also burdens the environment. 
It also helps cause climate change. They're all nested, they're all interconnected, but each item on this little slide here is a special interest group. It's a special professional group of people. It's nonprofit organizations that advocate for one at a time. It is institutions within our political structure. It's all stovepiped. And of course, I think urban form is what links it all together. You can't solve one problem without solving many problems. That's the good news of the situation. That's what's wonderful about cities. And so I can organize these things. I see the linkages. You know, there are these cluster of challenges. And then they link to, for example, travel behavior connects to lots of different things. Land use, technology, how much congestion there is, how much energy there is. But it all funnels down to travel behavior. And travel behavior is a product that, that can be adjusted through urban form. Land consumption, urban form, just tells us how much land we need to consume, how many resources we need to step on. Infrastructure, efficient, inefficient, all of it goes and interacts with the economic domain, the ecological domain, and the social domain. They're all together. So over the last 30 years, we've developed software that allowed us to understand all the layers of information, build scenarios, and analyze the scenarios. It's now become a product any designer or planner or city official can have. It's called Urban Footprint. And it has an astounding set of capabilities, millions and millions of data uh, that relate to the built environment. Uh, a thousand plus data sets and it's growing all the time. The ability to build hypothetical futures so we can actually investigate what works and what doesn't and in what arenas it works. And then finally, the scenario testing for the different models. It allows you to visualize all the consequences, understand the environment in ways that were really too invisible. Now let's think globally for a minute. Every city has qualities that are universal, like the distance you and I can walk is universal phenomenon. The distance we can recognize a face or hear a voice. Those are all physical parameters that every city attends to in some way uh, and have urban design consequences. But there are different categories of cities now, and I've broken them into three. And they are uh, framed around what I see as the biggest challenges. One is low-income sprawl. Most of the developing world, low-income population arrives. You know, the favelas that are deeply embedded in the cities, those are the rare ones. Most of the development happens at the periphery. And the low-income population is isolated and distant from the culture, the economic opportunities, the social uh, capital that a city has to offer. And that isolation is debilitating. It also hurts the environment. High density sprawl, sounds like an oxymoron, but China has perfected this. They're building high rise cities in the periphery of every major city that is effectively sprawl because it isolates uses, it isolates people. And so density isn't really equivalent to sprawl. So urbanism and density have nothing to do with each other. It's about the nature of the space and how they connect. What is the connecting fabric? Now, I don't call what we have low density sprawl. I call it high income sprawl. Environmentally, it's very, very demanding. It's, it's a kind of landscape that can be only sustained by massive wealth. And quite frankly, it's a kind of development that has already fell of its own way, internal weight. 2008 was a manifestation of that. But a lot of people think 2008 was all about uh, subprime mortgages and Wall Street ripping us off and, and bad fiscal controls. The reality was it was that we built too much of the wrong kind of housing in the wrong place and that the working class, the workforce of this country could no longer afford distant single family dwellings. And it wasn't just the mortgage that got jiggered down. It was the traveling, the commuting that it that it represented with all of its economic and social consequences. So this just shows Chicago around the uh, 2000, most of the foreclosures pretty evenly spread. 
Uh, in 2008, all the foreclosures are in the distant suburbs. Nobody talks about that. Where was this happening? This was happening in places where people had to drive till they qualified. That was the slogan the real estate agents have. If you couldn't afford a house here, just drive another 10 miles and you'll afford a house there. When transportation gets to be 20% of the household income, that's a big number. That means that where you choose to live is 50%, 60% of what you earn. And so I would say the middle class suburb has collapsed and we haven't found our way back. So let's bring that home. California. Only 50% of the people in California can f afford the rent or the mortgage on the average house. It's because we have a deficit of the right kind of housing, housing that's intrinsically affordable. Smaller, closer, in more walkable neighborhoods. That's affordable. Those three things alone would solve our housing problem. But the dilemma, of course, is where do you put it? Uh, and what are the politics of that? So we used Footprint to look at a statewide scenarios. Where do we put the next 10 million people? In one scenario, the standard business as usual, LA looked like this. Under more compact infill, look at the difference. Profound. Same number of people. Actually in better locations. Now, does everybody need and want a private yard? That may be the most profound question. Are they willing to trade it for accessibility and a great neighborhood that they can walk through to a neighborhood park? Maybe yes. But the question is, where is that walkable neighborhood with the great park? I started drilling down very recently into the Bay Area housing crisis. In the last eight years, we created almost 900,000 jobs and only 110,000 units of housing. It's obscene. And this is a map that shows jobs housing balance. Silicon Valley is a giant job machine. It's red in this map. Every place else has more housing, but it means that people are commuting great distances and that costs them too much. So let's think about building a future with three pieces, just for simplicity's sake. San Ramon, standard sprawl, shopping malls, subdivisions, office parks. Rockridge, a historic streetcar suburbs, one of those low density places I still call urban, walkable, mixed use. And then of course, San Francisco, which is not a very dense city by any global stretch of the imagination. What if we mix those three components and built a future for ourselves? And what if we said that the majority, 65%, was that walkable neighborhood like Rockridge? What are the consequences? Land saved. Seven areas the size of San Francisco saved from sprawl. Think of the environmental consequences. Infrastructure costs way down. Sooner or later, that comes into the pocketbook of everybody. Miles driven. Air quality collisions and injury, insurance, and of course, carbon and climate change. Building energy gets more efficient, more smaller, and uh, more party walls. Water use, a big issue in California. All of these things get profoundly better. Annual household, $3,000 is savings. These are serious numbers. Uh, respiratory costs, because all the driving leads to air quality impacts. So we can connect the dots, but it doesn't have any political traction. And so now we have to think about, well, how do you specifically engage everybody in the solution? I started thinking about something a long time ago, El Camino. So I grew up in Palo Alto. I know it well. But the strip is the icon of the American dream. And it's now dead. And I think it's going to nosedive even more after COVID. So there's a lot of wasted land there. So I wondered how much. 43 miles, historic. Footprint tells us that it's not vulnerable to flooding or fire. These are the overlay maps, so you can see that. But that's what it looks like. The cool thing is it's in every community. If you're going to put housing into the inner areas of Silicon Valley or the inner Bay Area where it's easy to move around using BART uh, and things are close. You want to distribute it. You don't want to say one city, you're going to solve the problem everybody else has. What if it became positive space? What if it became the space in which we solved the housing crisis? What if it looked like this? Totally feasible because that land is underutilized and undertaxed. 
So this is footprint looking for parcels of land that front on El Camino and or are near uh, Caltrain stations. They're in red here. They end up being enough for a quarter of a million households at a range of densities from townhouse all the way. And simultaneously, those houses all have these other environmental and economic benefits. So then what about uh, the rest of the Bay Area? So we did the same kind of screening, discovered 15,000 acres of underutilized commercial land in these ribbons all around the Bay. Interestingly enough, uh, 1.2 million units, a lot of it in Santa Clara where you would want it to be. So we have a housing solution. We need to make the solution ubiquitous. We need to have it support a whole new network of mobility. And what we've got with BART and Caltrains and a few other things, just not enough. Furthermore, we can't put a heavy foot on existing neighborhoods. You can't draw a circle around a transit station and say, we're going to wipe out these neighborhoods. They're historic. They're beloved in some cases. Sometimes they're affordable housing. You don't want to be heavy-handed. You want to be precise. The beauty of the tools we have is that we can be incredibly precise. So we can go from this environment to this environment. But the first question I'm asked about this strategy is, okay, that's a great land reservoir, but if you put you know, 1.2 million people on our corridors, isn't that going to lead to massive congestion? And the answer is, not if we rebuild the corridor itself, not if we rebuild the street. The right solution is to give priority to transit. If transit doesn't run on a private congestion-free lane, nobody's going to bother with it. And so BRT is well-known, the most cost-effective. So basically, the bus becomes a train on its own dedicated space. But it was affordable to a low, lower-income city, and it proved to be every bit as, as good as rail transit. We don't have much of it in the Bay Area. We're starting to build it. But El Camino is a great place for it. So this is just a very kind picture of El Camino. It's 120 feet. In 120 feet, I can build 15-foot sidewalks tree-lined. I can build bikeways. I can build dedicated lanes for transit. And I can still have six goddamn lanes for cars. What if that BRT turned into really nimble, semi-express little vans where you put in your phone, you get on a van that's pretty much clustering origins and destinations, and then it largely takes you directly to your destination. So rather than being on a big bus, stopping at every station, you get to be in a small van with a few people going direct to destination, but on a dedicated right-of-way, so you're not fighting your way through traffic. That's a big revolution because we've been stuck transit-wise, in 19th century technology. And it, I think we can use autonomy and that kind of intelligence to actually enhance and build, give birth to a whole new generation of transit. The consequence of uh, rebuilding the Strip isn't just in building a better place and adding housing and, and building transit and bikeways and all the rest of that. It's taking underutilized land and creating high enough property values that can begin to drive our st state economy in a healthier direction. A lot of people will say, well, you're going to build all this housing, but where's the parks and the schools and all the peripheral costs? Well, we used to have something called tax increment financing, which means that the, the amount of tax that comes out of a changed land use can be recycled into the community, put back into the local schools, local parks, build transit bikeways. Um, there's an, there would be an explosion of economic well-being for the state and for the cities if we were able to capture the increased property values that result from re-envisioning the Strip. The El Camino as a Grand Boulevard means that it's not just a transit corridor or it's not just a place with multifamily housing. It's a beautiful place you want to be. Uh, when Hausman uh, intervened in Paris and built those boulevards, they became a source of pride. They became a place that people wanted to go to. So it's not just a matter of satisfying the housing or building new transit. It's also enhancing the community around it. Okay, that's America. I think America can solve the next two uh, decades of, of growth by just reusing the gray fields. 
that our strip commercial has produced. China. China is a place where 800 million people have come out of poverty by moving to cities. It's all about speed and efficiency, or it has been. And there's not a lot of unique place making going on. They shifted to cars. And of course, the pedestrian and the bikes have gone by the wayside. This is the kinds of place that create community and connectedness on a local level and human scale. And they're all going by the wayside. This is inside a super block with 5,000 units of housing. There's not a sidewalk in sight. There's not a ground floor shop in sight. This is urban coercion. The urban environment tells you what to do, and it sure ain't walking to the neighborhood store. This is one I found actually in one of those super blocks in China where they had converted all the garages to local shops. You can't stop people from doing the right thing, even if it involves breaking the law. This looks like some weird chess game or something, but actually it's a model of a community that we got a chance to redesign. And these are major arterials that sit at about 500 meters. That's over a quarter mile. It's the only through streets, and so they're ginormous. And then each block is single use. This is exactly the same quantity of development and exactly the same amount of asphalt, except the red streets are auto-free. So you can build with the same investment, with the same quantitative outcome, a much more humane urban landscape. So here's Chongqing. This is a city in the West, 30 million population. I mean, it's almost as big as California in terms of population. Very fractured landscape. And they asked us to test our ideas of walkability, sustainable environments in a study area that was basically equivalent to a place for 4 million people. It's just north of the historic city center and just you can see west of the airport to the right there in the picture. And so we applied our principles. Number one being start with the natural environment. What's the topography? Where are the ecologies? Where are the repairing corridors? Preserve the things that matter to the environment. And so the mask shows the things that are going to be developed, and the unmasked are the preserved open space. That's the existing development. Got to work with what's there. And a, a road network, which is essential regardless. We still have trucks, buses, cars. We have to move them. But that defines these zones, these areas where you can create walkable, unimpeded, unbarriered environments that can easily connect for somebody on a bicycle or on foot or can be where the transit goes. Because of the standards that are now in place in China, that is a red network of metro lines. Just imagine if we spent that kind of money on transit. I think people would actually be pretty comfortable using it. There's a red zone in there, which is a study area that they gave us to show, uh, but what does it look like to live in? That's the plan we did for that particular area. Human scale blocks, diversity in use, walkable streets. We went from the picture on the left to the picture on the right. We went from two large single use zones to a mixed use environment built around human scale. The green space not only preserved the most sensitive environmental areas at the water's edge and made them common space, but you'll see green lines moving up. Those are auto-free streets. In China today, depending on which city you're at, only 20 to 30% of households own cars. So I wonder why all the streets are for cars when 70% of the people don't own a car. So this is a boulevard that has transit, bikes and pedestrians. No cars, no trucks. It's a right of way. Deserves to be, and in many, many cities can be, and now in China it is. Our design standards said we need one of these every kilometer on center. So the idea of this green setback and diverse housing uh, and mixed use came into being. It's now under construction. So the third type of city I called low-income sprawl, where the poor really are relegated to the periphery, 
Uh, and the first place we worked was Mexico City. And this is what the outer skirts of Mexico City look like. Social housing. It's way out there. Why? Because it's cheap land and they think they get more bang for the buck. Below, much more interesting, informal housing, which is self-built and kind of rough cowboy stuff where the property owners uh, just throw the land on the market and don't worry about streets or power or anything like that. And people go in and build amazing communities, but in the wrong place, way too far away. Uh, and of course, the, they have this amazing transit system, which are kind of a democratic form of bus where people own their own bus and they drive certain routes. But it just means it leads to chaos. They stop anywhere. They start, you know, they pull over to pick somebody up everywhere. Uh, and of course, the congestion levels are just out of control because of that. This, once again, is a, a city w without a high auto ownership ratio. And so the, the efficacy of the buses is terribly important. So let's look at the big systemic picture here. The wealthy are in the city center where the culture and the economy and the history, the human scale and the mix is richest and the poor are at the periphery. The jobs are all concentrated at the center. And so the poor are even more disenfranchised by being farther and farther away from economic opportunity. We then mapped mobility, and we said there was one category, the best, where you could walk and get transit. The second category was you could get transit, but it wasn't really walkable. The third was walkable, but no decent transit. And the fourth was none of the above. Well, none of the above turned out to be 67% of the environment. There's a mobility crisis in this city, as well as an economic stratification. And we do our uh, urban footprint scenario planning, uh, and we look at all these metrics. Design categories are, how do you use land? Where do you put housing and jobs? What kind of transport do you invest in? And what kind of urban configuration? Is it walkable and human scale, or is it single and, and auto-oriented? And then even more bewildering is this matrix of outcomes. But for those people who really care about the future of that city, being able to see that there's a linkage between uh, the land consumption, water being a big issue, air quality, infrastructure costs, travel time for low income populations, uh, all of these things can be arrayed so that coalitions begin to come together. Because each one of these columns represents a different special interest group. Uh, and if they can actually say, hey, what works for me works for you, you then have coalition building that you didn't know about. And so the chemistry of the politics can change. Now, I'm right in the midst of working on Ho Chi Minh City. And it's an amazing city of 9 million people. It's grown at a massive rate. I mean, this is the classic picture of a successful developing nation, central city. And of course, it's in the Delta. Vietnam is one of the most flood plains countries in the world. It's nothing but one long coastline. Most of its population is on the coast where it's vulnerable to climate change, sea rise, and typhoons. You can see throughout existing Ho Chi Minh City, a lot of development in the floodplain, literally right out over the water. This is our mapping of Ho Chi Minh City. The orange is uh, existing development in the flood zone, about 400 square kilometers. And then they have a master plan that shows more development in the floodplain, another 500 square kilometers. McKinsey recently did a study for a 2050 kind of high-end climate change sea rise scenario and massive quantities of development infrastructure, key infrastructure was put out of use. And so they can't afford the future that they're building. The first thing we wanna do is map resettlement areas, areas that were high ground. The yellow areas are approximately high ground. Some of it is close to the existing city, some of it is distant. So in a, I, ironically, I've been uh, bad-mouthing new towns for a long, long time, and yet this is a case study for moving to high ground for the next generation of people and building a new city up there in the area of B, C, and D. Sparsely populated, um, high ground, connected to 
uh, Ho Chi Minh City. And you have to connect the region. They're building metro. It's very expensive and very difficult for them. The ecological systems around this kind of wet, humid environment necessitates a lot of green space, a lot of water flow and detention areas. And of course, they're filling it all up with, with development. The waterways that exist are impounded by solid waste, so they need a, a much healthier uh, recycling system. So the stuff doesn't end up in the waterways and, and cause more flooding. Now, this is the part that I'm most excited about in this case. I look at, at uh, Vietnam, everybody's on a motorcycle. 90% of trips are on motorcycles. It's more unique, more variable, more uh, consumer friendly. But the problem, of course, is you jam it into streets that are filled with cars and buses and trucks, and all of a sudden, nobody's moving. So why not give motorcycles what we give transit, a private right-of-way? So traffic engineers and transit engineers think of capacity in terms of peak hour, how many people can pass through a point, uh, which gives you the quantity of flow. And so you start at one end very low, 2,000 cars can get through a lane in an hour. But then you go all the way up to mass transit and you can have 80,000 people. If you take a bicycle, which is 14,000 passengers per lane, but then you factor it up for the higher speeds of the motorcycle and maybe for one and a half people, all of a sudden you're into 30,000 passengers per lane, which is higher than light rail. So you could give just space to the motorcycles and you'd be doing as well, if not better, than light rail for almost no cost. So why not give streets just to motorcycles? So this is our prototypical street network, and the orange streets are motorcycle streets. The purple streets are mixed flow streets. And then there are local streets that just go to your doorstep. Don't go anywhere else. So there's no through traffic. And so this is what we're experimenting with, is actually form-fitting the solution to the culture. It's technically feasible that those orange streets filled with Bikes and bicycles could be all electric. And all of a sudden, you have probably the best transportation system on the planet. So that's really one of my favorite things. The other thing, of course, is housing. There's so many different types of housing. But I'll tell you one that I just fell in love with, which is actually the normative housing type. They call them shop houses. There's always a ground floor shop. There's always something happening. The second category is informal, where people build their own. You have to make space for that, because that's actually one of the healthiest way to produce housing. And you know, they get a little plot of land and they build something small, and then as the family grows, they keep adding height to it. And so what we do has to have space for that. They need social housing and they're building it, affordable housing. And new development, interestingly enough, already does it looks pretty sterile, but it's good in certain ways because there are shop houses, there are high-rise condos, there are affordable housing, and they're all together. Carbon emissions, you can see on the bottom set of graphs, from 1995 to 1950, the increase in ambient temperature in the urban center. And it's because they don't have streets big enough to breathe. They don't have street trees. They don't have open spaces that allow the breeze to move through. They need to put, incorporate the, all of that sensibility into their next great city. The walkable neighborhood idea, and it has these elements, all the daily destinations within the neighborhood, schools, shops, parks, everywhere you would go on a daily basis is right there. A whole range of housing types. The wealthy get their high-rise condos, the affordable apartment buildings, the shop houses line the motorcycle streets, uh, and then the self-built sites and services where you give them a road, you give them a piece of land, you give them utility hookups, and then they take it from there. The point being that these are all integrated in one place. They're not separated across the landscape in the city. These are really big principles. And you'll note the quantity of open space, which is proportional to the need for the ecological environment of a kind of permeable environment in which you can absorb the rainwater and detain it in a way that doesn't lead to flooding. 
Here's a, one of our sites that we're studying for growth there. 800,000 population. It's more than San Francisco. It sits on 15 square miles. And yet, each one of those red dots is the center of a neighborhood with lots of open space and local services. And there's a big armature of open space that works ecologically and from a recreation standpoint. So there are big solutions. I'll conclude with uh, another project I'm working on right now for the World Bank, which was everybody says there is no such thing as a universal solution. And I actually think that's fundamentally wrong. And because we don't conceive of universal solutions, we wander around as if we don't know what to do. But there's all sorts of things that are fundamentally correct, no matter where you are. And I'm going to give you a list. First is you need to understand and preserve natural ecologies, history, and culture. Many places actually, in their rush to development, overlook all of that. The Urban Growth Foundry is the one dimension of this particular principle. that You need to preserve what's most valuable in a place. That's a universal principle. And you can actually assign specific actions to making it real. You can map where all the ecological uh, and endangered species are. Uh, you can isolate buildings and historic places. Second is mixed use. There's no great city that isn't mixed use. This is a universal principle. What does mixed use mean? Uh, it means that instead of zoning by use, here's one kind of housing here, there's a shopping center here, there's an office park here, and they don't overlap, they don't combine, they're isolated and separate. Mixed use literally puts things side by side, say within a city block or even vertically, so housing over shops. But mixed use also has a more profound meaning that you don't build one kind of housing for one income group in one place. You mix different housing opportunities together so that there's a range of people all interacting in their common area. You know, mixed use also means bring nature into the environment rather than putting it in a separate category somewhere else. That's what people desire. That's what people love. And it's actually the most robust socially because it involves the kinds of interaction that makes society civil. Connections. The scale of development. There are absolutes there. The human body describes a human scale. And connections really have to be framed there. That's another universal principle. Public space. Architects focus on buildings, objects. You've got to think about the space between the buildings. That's where life happens. And that's where the life of a culture in a city happen. And you can actually talk about what scale the neighborhood parks are, how frequent they should be, and what kind of regional and cultural facilities need to happen at what scale. These are all knowable principles. No great place is without walking and biking. And there are some very simple rules about that. You know, how wide should a bike lane be? We know. It's the same here as it is anywhere else in the world. We can actually put it down and say this is a universal best practice. We need to enhance transit. Certainly, we've had an explosion of all sorts of local mobility forms, and that's all very exciting. We need to make space in our right-of-ways for all of that. And we need to focus. We need to use those modes as the armature of growth. We need to stop using freeways as the framework of our city. And we have to start making walkable streets and transit networks the, the armature around which we grow the city. So these are all things we know and we can actually quantify and we can quantify the benefits. And it doesn't hurt to have a checklist. And it's exciting that World Bank would say, yes, we're interested in having something like that. Because when we give you uh, massive amounts of money for infrastructure, maybe we'd like to see a checklist here of best practice in building cities. So I have lots of hope about the future of cities, clearly. Um, and I have hope that it solves our most uh, intransient uh, problems. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That was fantastic. I love ending with the, the sort of the menu of things to do right, and then we can proceed. 
Um, so you and I are semi together in uh, this bar in San Francisco. Uh, fortunately, it's empty, and uh, we get to not wear masks because we're far enough apart. <laughs> um, but it raises the, the question of, of COVID, of the pandemic. Basically, everything you're saying is uh, the denser uh, we live, the uh, more congested we are, basically, and sitting on top of each other in cities, the better. But isn't that a bit of a problem in a time of a pandemic? You know, there's no evidence at all that that's the case. Uh, some of the places on the planet that have been most successful in beating back the um, uh, COVID uh, are highly urban places. Uh, uh, Japan has succeeded. Uh, uh, South Korea has succeeded. Singapore is a model of, of low transmission rates. And, you know, it's ironic. You even look uh, in the United States, uh, Manhattan, of the five boroughs, has the lowest incident rate now of any other place. So there's no correlation between urbanism and COVID spread. COVID spread is about behavior. It's about how people act. You know, if you go to a restaurant that isn't well ventilated and there's not the proper spacing, uh, it doesn't matter if it's in a 30-story building or sitting in a parking lot at a shopping mall. You have the same problem. So it's it's more about human behavior and our lack of ability to bring ourselves to some kind of simple level of control. Well, speaking of sitting in parking lots, uh, I was sitting in the middle of uh, a street in Sausalito the other night having dinner. And... Um, five or six restaurants that are lined up on Caledonia Street uh, with nobody inside, everybody out in the street, everybody looking pretty happy, and pretty much everybody saying, how come we can't do this all the time? And the uh, the, the lowering of the cities that, that are dealing with the pandemic, the you know, shut in and so on, uh, there's less street traffic in, in terms of cars, but more hanging out in terms of people. Um, do you think we're going to go back, or is this now a new era for cities that people want to do more of the way you want them to do, which is hang out uh, in public? You know, that was happening before COVID. I mean, uh, New York City had been taking back lanes. Uh, we'd been uh, pushing parking stalls aside for sidewalk cafes and, and bars. And the whole sense that more asphalt will solve our mobility problems is pretty much a dead, dead on arrival concept at this point. People are excited by alternative ways of getting around, whether they're electric scooters and tricycles and, uh, um, and more and more biking and more and more walking. This is what people are voting for uh, as they move now. They want to be in in places that are better connected and have more, uh, have richer public spaces. Um, it's not a mystery. You know, when you go on vacation, you don't go to a shopping mall. Uh, you tend to go to a historic city where you can walk and enjoy the places uh, and the sense of place that's been created over an incredible amount of time in history. Um, so I think that there's a predating this recent phenomena, uh, a pretty large movement. There was a stunning uh, article in the New York Times uh, published uh, illustrating uh, a proposition. What if we got rid of private automobiles on Manhattan Island? And the images that you see are extraordinary. And all of a sudden you realize, well, wait a minute, actually you don't need um, to have all those private automobiles. People can get around in taxis and buses and bikes and walk and it all clearly will work. There's no mystery. The problem is, well, how can you do that in the American suburb, which was designed around the car? You know, everything is framed for the car. Everything has a, a giant asphalt apron around it for parking your car. Um, but I see that, I call them the gray fields, as the great opportunity. We can infill our way, redesign those places, and redevelop them. That's what the El Camino Grand Boulevard idea is all about, is we should take the worst places in our communities and transform them. Does it mean that people will lose, use their cars less? Yeah, 
and some people will be very stressed by that. They want to be free to move at 60 miles an hour whenever they want to. But the reality, of course, is that they don't get to do that. The average in mobility speed in most urban areas is pretty low now. Um, and so getting on a BRT system or getting on what I call ART, autonomous rapid transit, um, is going to be a, minute, a better wait a minute, option. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so bus rapid transit, autonomous rapid transit, but supposedly self-driving cars or autonomous vehicles are going to come along and save the city all by themselves. Isn't that the case? That's the hype, but the reality is by any analysis, it'll just generate massive multiples of vehicle miles traveled. In other words, the average amount of car on the road driving miles will increase. Why? Well, let's say you have your own autonomous vehicle. You take it to work. Maybe you send it to a distant parking lot because it's cheaper than parking near where you work. That's extra miles. Maybe you send it home so somebody else uses it all day. So now you've done a four-way commute. So the numbers there are about a 30% increase in average vehicle miles traveled per household. So let's take the second case. Uber and, and um, uh, the uh, taxi services become autonomous. There's something called deadhead, which is when a car is circula circling looking for the next passenger or actually going to the, to the call location. And that represents easily a 50 to 60% increase in vehicle miles traveled. Uh, and so uh, if you uh, have a single passenger environment with those autonomous vehicles, and you give up your car, you think you're hip, um, you're still generating more traffic and using more energy. Now, it's all equal if it's everything gets electrified, but the congestion level and the environment still suffers by this multiplication of travel. So congestion will go through the ceiling if we get autonomous vehicles, if we can get them to work. Now that's a whole nother matter. Now, if we use them on dedicated lanes as transit vehicles, all of a sudden they become completely benign. They're not traveling empty. They're not traveling uh, extra miles. They're on a route and they're serving more and more people. So. Uh, it's a classic case. It's, it's technology. If you use it well, it's great. If you use it poorly, it can be dis incredibly destructive. Well, how would that work? If you have bus rapid transit, it has its own lane, buses come and go. Can they blend with autonomous vehicles that are maybe smaller, that can do more kind of dedicated trips, sort of like those informal buses that you saw in the informal cities that you like? Yeah, it's complex. There'll be a complex uh, transition. I think we'll start building dedicated lanes. And don't forget, we shouldn't measure the world by America. I mean, this is the mentality we all have. Like This is the way we are, and therefore, uh, it's really the only way to live. In most of the world, people are transit, bike, pedestrian bound. In most of the world, people don't own cars. Uh, and so uh, they, how effective those private routes are, or auto-free streets that I like to throw into my projects whenever I can, um, those create environments where you can mix the autonomous, the small autonomous with the larger uh, bus. And once again, once the communication system between the vehicles gets sophisticated enough, the passing lanes can all be used as uh, into oncoming traffic, believe it or not. And so you, you get more and more efficiency. That's one of the promises of autonomous technology is that it can be very efficient in how vehicles communicate with one another. You're going to bring back the three-lane highway. I can just see it. <laughs> three lane. <laughs> Remember the passing lane in the middle where you took your life in your hands when you yeah, went out there? Yeah, that's right. No, actually, I've got that on the drawing board, Stuart. <laughs> so in several cases. Okay, here's a question from online from Gil Friend at Facebook. Uh, he begins, this is a great vision, Peter, and well-grounded. I agree. And he says, completely sensible. But sensible isn't what drives politics. What's been your experience in overcoming resistance to change, both in general and from folks who fear negative impacts? And, I mean, here's an example. You know, we got 
the housing issue in the Bay Area, and there's the NIMBY saying, never in my backyard, and the YIMBY saying, no, by God, yes, in my backyard, and they're duking it out. That's politics. Yeah, and politics shifts with different kinds of coalitions and different kinds of economic and environmental forces, and so things are changing. You know, it was uh, 1988, I went to Portland and worked for an environmental group there that wanted to preserve the urban growth boundary by not allowing a new Beltway freeway to be built outside of that line and, and there catalyze more sprawl. And we proposed the, the, the uh, West Side Light Rail Line and the whole idea of transit-oriented development was first planted was not only would we take the money from that freeway and use it for a transit line, but we would then zone for density at each one of the stations. And lo and behold, politically, they've done it, you know, and it's now normative. The idea of transit oriented development is normative all over the world. I mean, if you go up to Canada and you look at how Toronto and, and Vancouver grow, um, it's taken for granted that transit is the armature and walkable neighborhoods is the everyday development uh, standard. Um, so these things do change. How rapidly? I don't know. In America, I'm not going to sit here and argue with you that we are not in gridlock. We're in ideological gridlock. We're in an us and them world. Um, and so even rational solutions get set aside by this kind of mentality that we've that we've arrived at, and it's heartbreaking to tell you the truth. Um, the politics. Let's talk about the politics of the Grand Boulevard idea. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right. Some yeah, time ago, talk there, to Gavin Newsom, our governor, pretty soon. I hope about this, right? Yeah. Well, we'll see. <laughs> I'd like to, but I want to actually gather enough grassroots uh, support and recognition before you go to that level. But. The history is interesting. There was a, a, a legislator here from San Francisco that proposed the, the TOD idea and said, as of right, anything within a quarter or half mile of transit should be dense. And it didn't, it wasn't careful about going into single family historic neighborhoods or the avenues here in San Francisco or, you know, all the complexity of place. And it just said, as of right, we should do this. And the backlash was huge. Out of that came the, uh, the not the NIMBYs, the YIMBYs, who said, God damn it, we're going to stop defending the right of these single family neighborhoods to you know, maintain their economic and land-based separation. My attitude is, if you can find enough land somewhere else, why step on anybody's toes? So the strip and that, all that commercial land that, by the way, Amazon is making um, pure history for uh, uh, the bricks and mortar there. Why not just use what's available and not uh, uh, go into a, a protracted battle that's unnecessary? We have plenty of land. We can. It's in the right place in the sense that it's near where we can put transit, and it's ubiquitous. Um, and so. I think that there's something about in politics about just finding the, the, the path of least resistance. And if you can define that, um, you can uh, maybe succeed. The other thing, of course, is that economics and politics go hand in hand. Well, let's, you know, we all know this. And one of the reasons that cities don't want housing is that um, it's expensive. All the services, police, fire, schools, parks, and so every city wants jobs and no cities want housing because of what's called fiscal zoning. So they get more taxes from job yeah. opportunities from, and yeah. less taxes from housing opportunities. Yeah. So it turns out that on the strip, because the land has such, such low property values, I mentioned that in the clip, um, tax increment financing would actually bring a lot of money to those communities. So instead of feeling like it's our duty to build housing, even though it's going to put us in, uh, have a negative fiscal impact, they can clearly say to their community, yes, we're going to add housing, but we're going to have money for parks and transit and schools and community facilities and bikeways and all the things that will enrich our community. So you got to 
step lightly, and you've got to think about the economics. Well, that relates to a question that Kevin Kelly put up on YouTube. If someone wanted to visit a well-crafted, livable city, in your terms, uh, where would you point them? Boy, there's a hundred places, historic uh, city centers around the world. You know, I wouldn't say it's a place. It's more a time. You know, it's the time before the automobile became the paradigm of proj uh, progress and uh, the form giver of our communities. You've so, had some exciting urban experiences that you sort of hearken to when you think about what... The way well, you want me to name like, names, but uh, what I was about to say is that there's an interesting thing in the old National Geographic maps of our country. Um, they started coloring the urban environment purple uh, at around 1962. And all the other urban fabric was pink. So if you look at those maps... And just about any pink spot is good urbanism because we were a country of great cities and beautiful streetcar suburbs and, and small towns that were mixed use and walkable. So there was great urbanism everywhere. And our streetcars, of course, were uh, bought up and destroyed by G uh, Standard Oil and, and Goodyear and one other bit of the conglomerate, I can't remember. And literally, re you know, replaced by buses that then tried to had had to slug their way through uh, traffic with cars. So we've got great urbanism everywhere. What's my favorite place on the planet? Jeez. I, I just can't. I mean, there are too many of them, Stuart. Okay, really. well, I'll, I'll ask you a more embarrassing question, which I ask all architects, which is, uh, as you and I have talked about back in when I was working on How Buildings Learn, uh, architects don't learn because they were careful not to go back to the buildings they built because they were always so um, depressed by you know, what had happened and different things were happening that I planned for and uh, their maintenance issues that they were being held accountable for and basically uh, the further the original architect could get from the original building, the happier they were, <laughs> the more unhappy the, the occupants were. So uh, you've designed a number of urban places now. Uh, where are the ones you like to go back to? You know, it's ironic, but it's o old Sacramento, one of them. You know, when Jerry was governor the first time and we were all hanging out there, and we were really beginning to think through what an environmentally stable future would look like. And we did a lot of fascinating things. Jerry said, we're going to start building state office buildings that are going to define energy efficiency. And Sim and I got to design the Bateson building. This which is was, 1977 or 8? Yeah, or 5. We started in 75. And the Bateson building was a low-rise building with a courtyard and a lot of thermal mass. So the climate there is cool evenings and really hot days. So we would flush it out. And just like an old adobe building would store the cool, as we called it, we used natural lighting and operable windows. It hadn't been done for 30 years in an office building, right? It was all smoked mirror glass and sealed and run through an HVA. Uh, radical. And the building's still there, and it's really beautiful. And then just across the park from that uh, building, we got to design a housing complex that was radical on just about every level. It was one-third market rate, one-third affordable, and one-third subsidized housing. So it was an economic mix within one city block. And we built different types of, of housing, some townhouses, some apartments, and some ground floor shops. Uh, and then most radical in terms of the solar, solar not passive solar design always needs thermal mass, right? You need to absorb the sunlight and store it for when you need it or you need it for cool night air. So we went back to using lath and plaster on the walls instead of sheetrock. And the lath and plaster has like seven times more thermal mass than sheetrock. Yeah. And so we found some old timers who knew how to kind of rediscover that technology. But it was interesting to me that all these things were connected, that if you tried to solve for passive solar design, you ended up rethinking the materials in your building. 
and and how the building went together and how it was oriented. So it was all just a tremendous amount of fun. The most radical thing, and nobody ever gets this right, but the Bateson building, famous, you know, it consumes just 20% of the average office building. And they became the the kind of the, the benchmark for Title 24, which is California's very famous energy standards in buildings, way before LEED and all the rest of that. Um, we set on a course, and actually because of what we have, pretty low carbon rate per capita in this state. Um, and it has all this, you know, operable shades and trellises and a big atrium with moving devices that let sunlight in in the winter and keep it out in the summer and, you know, all this fabulous stuff. And I ask people, well, what do you think is the most ef energy efficient part of this building? And they name this or that. The most energy efficient part was that there was zero parking. Normally, a quarter million square foot building would have uh, uh, basically three times its footprint in asphalt surrounding it for all the people to show up in their cars. And for downtown Sacramento, we said, nope, no parking. People have to figure out how to get there on their own. We added the light rail system in Sacramento at that time. So it was like a little laboratory where we got to play around with all these ideas. And the truth is, I haven't had a good idea since. I mean, it's just all the same ideas recycled. But I can't even, I can't even remember your question, Stuart. Uh, well, there you went out of a good distance there. Uh, it does raise a uh, question that uh, Kim Sykes asked on <clears throat> YouTube, which is, are there, uh, do you have some thoughts or examples on making better use of rooftops? Uh, especially in maybe a public way. Rooftops, so rooftops at least got realized and they, they always were kind of the detritus of a building, They're the place where you put all of the uh, great big noisy uh, HVAC, uh, heating, ventilating, air conditioning apparatus, and uh, they were basically hidden, they were flat, they leaked, and <clears throat> roofs were semi to be not even thought about. Um, but in New York, at least, you started getting these little scenes up on people's roofs that are like their own little mini parks or something, and that was pretty cool, and gardens and whatnot. And then solar came along, and uh, solar started to occupy a number of roofs. So what's the best use of, of the tops of buildings? All of the above. I mean, in so many Latin countries, the rooftop is the coolest place to hang out, the breezes and the views and the trellises. And, and connected buildings, their rooftops are connected. People can wander from one to another. Yeah, in some I mean, it's places. just a whole nother level. But once again, it's not a single family world. It's a, you know, it's joint. It's, it's an urban environment. Um, and we're seeing that now in the kind of higher density housing that does get built around the Bay Area. A lot of rooftop amenities going in. Oh yeah, developers are just head over heels. They've discovered something totally new. But of course, it's been around for a very long time. Uh, why not use the solar collectors as, sh as shades in a trellis? You, you know, it's not one or the other that uh, you have to play around with. But it's a, it's a resource. It's one important resource, just like uh, the quality of the sidewalk is a resource. Uh, there are many things to always uh, mix. So the, and you're doing some work in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles is famous for having approximately no parks um, and not much public area of any kind. Uh, how do you fix a, an already seriously broken situation like that? Precisely. Say more. Well, I, I don't think there's a, you, you know, I love to come up with grand principles that are universal. It, but the application of a principle always has to be very unique to the place I see. and very precise. So you, you need to want me to ask you about you need, a place just south of, south of the Los Angeles River that's two blocks away from it and uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you have to go in surgically and find the right places where you can do it. Once again, we did a similar analysis, the El Camino analysis for LA County and discovered, yes, there's tremendous amount of opportunity there. And if the tax base rises because of the infill, all of a sudden you got the money to buy land and build parks. 
And more often than not, pocket parks, small parks, are uh, perhaps the most valuable. They're the most accessible, local, and they bring people together in a neighborhood more effectively than big, you know, Golden Gate Park or, you know, nobody's going to say anything bad about uh, Central Park, but, you know, th 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 it has to happen at different scales. Uh, I think we're heading toward wrapping up and the standard wrap-up question is, um, you've been covering many decades of your work and thought here. Where are you at now? What's next in your mind? What's next do you want to do with your <laughs> professional practice? Well, I'm still working on new books. I've written a lot of them and hopefully they're helpful. Um, for a while, I was just swept away by working in China because what they were doing was so grand and huge and so off target that it was just a very rich domain to to participate. You know, and as I said in the clip, there they they brought more people out of poverty than has ever been witnessed in the history of mankind, and but to have, bring them into cities that. I can see 30 or 40 years from now we'll be failing just like our public housing towers fail, you know, because of the scaleless, placeless quality of it. Um, so I was very excited about working there and, and doing everything that well, they, I could to so change that. So they were that. both listening to you and then acting on what you said. That's, that's a rare combination. Uh, but what did that mean? So you're working with what? Are they city managers or uh, Politburo people? I mean, what kind of? No, it was very what's, hard. What's the level? We 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 presented some ideas to uh, to the the equivalent of their equivalent of HUD, and also the state council, which is Politburo I'm saying level. Urban design is HUD. Yeah. yeah, and we said, look, here's your problem. Look at the problem, and they all recognize. They all see see you know this qual this uh, this deadly quality. They kept building. You know. I think they're on the ninth ring road in Beijing. I mean, they keep building it, thinking the next one will fix it, and it never, ever will. Um, and they build super blocks that are so big that the streets that surround them are inhospitable to anything but cars, and therefore everybody wants a car now. Everybody feels like there's no place for them to go if they don't have a car. And then, of course, they're in massive gridlock because the density is so great. So it's it was just a cascading problem. So we presented some big ideas and they said very science based, very secular, right? Let's test these ideas. So they gave us yeah, they gave us eight cities to work with. Eight and cities. Eight cities to go, you know, different parts of the country to experiment, just to demonstrate that small city blocks and human scale streets and auto free streets and mixed use and all that, that litany of principles could actually happen in China, given Chinese culture and Chinese economy and whatnot. And after about six years of working, the answer came back and it was yes. And the, the state council went into a session dedicated to urban standards and they adopted it all. Bingo. That list, I mean, that's uh, a lot easier than California, I got to tell you. That's how China is building cities now is by those principles, are you telling? Yes, very much so. Uh-oh. It's just amazing. We'll see. And then, of course, it will deteriorate and be less than perfect. But that's what cities are. I mean, they're always less than perfect. And it's actually all the idiosyncratic failures that make them really interesting. Um, but there'll be this other force that at least begins to write the most egregious problems. So that was, you asked me, what am I into doing now? I'm into coming home. This, this idea of solving the housing crisis um, you know, we didn't talk a lot about affordable housing and homelessness, and, but uh, it's my theory that you, once again, you can go at it stovepipe and say, we need affordable housing, we need nonprofit groups to get a bunch of subsidies and go out and build affordable housing. There's, in addition to that, you also need uh, enough housing that the economic pressure is not pushing people down and out. You know, when you have a housing shortage, the prices go up. I mean, this is economics. And as the prices go up, the people at the bottom of the economic ladder go out. 
they either go farther and farther into the Sacramento Valley and commute all half of their life, or they go out on the street. So uh, I'm pretty passionate about housing supply, getting enough housing, and enough of the right kind of housing. Not everybody now can, should, or wants to have a single-family dwelling. It always used to be the norm. It's just America, right? Everybody's got to have a house on a cul-de-sac and a couple cars. The word everybody is no longer so simple. We're a much more diverse culture uh, with all sorts of different desires, complexities. So we should have a much more diverse housing stock, not one size fits all anymore. So uh, yeah, for me, right at this phase, I, I'm, I'm interested in coming back and doing battle at home. Well, thank you for doing that. Thank you for speaking tonight. Thank you, audience, for joining us and for your good questions. And we'll hope to see you at another Long Now seminar about long-term thinking uh, with another speaker uh, as good as Peter Calthorpe. Good night, good day, good morning, wherever you are. <laughs>